Hi everybody, Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite. With me today, I've got Nancy and we're going to be talking about her new book, uh, Using Behavioural Science in Marketing. Um, Nancy, before we get, you know, explain to people where they can get hold of you. Uh, sure. So you can you can find me uh, all over the socials. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at at N Harhut N H A R H U T. Or just email me N Harhut at me M E dot com. And uh, would love to connect with people. Fantastic. So Nancy, um, I was actually saying this before we 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 went on air. Uh, I love the book. Thank you. Um, and and there are and what I I mean I. I saw I saw the book out on LinkedIn. I thought that looks really interesting. I need to get Nancy on my podcast. So um, I contacted you, etc. And and when I I started reading the book, and I thought you know there'd be a couple of techniques, and then the rest of it would be fluff. And it's not this twenty five techniques that you go through. It's like you you do get you get technique, te and you go. And I was going, I need to use this one. I need to use this one. And as I said to you just before we came on, I put a blog out um just the other week which is you're facing an important decision and if you don't act quickly someone else will decide for you and and that was from that was an idea from your your book yes that's called autonomy bias and uh, the idea is um humans have this very deep-seated innate urge to um be in, in control of ourselves and our environment. Like we like to exercise some kind of control. And what behavioral scientists have found is when you give somebody a choice, that actually makes them feel that they're in control. When you suggest that you're going to take a choice away from them, well, they'll react very strongly against that. So by saying, hey, you've got to make a decision soon. And if you don't, someone will make it for you. That really kind of uh, harnesses that that need for autonomy. And it wakes people up and makes them say, oh, no, you don't. I'm I'm making the decision for myself. You're not going to be interfering in, in my affairs. So so I'm glad that it worked for you. That's good. Well, it, it was good. It, it, it was one of those where um, I used it as a blog title and then put it out there. And immediately we were people we were doing exactly that. You're not deciding for me. And it was it, it, it just, you know, on LinkedIn, it got the discussion that I wanted. Um, and, and it's just a, it's a, a great example of what's in here in terms of the book about the, the power. Um, uh, Beth, who's just made the comment, I know is in marketing, and it's like one of those. It, it's one of those books in marketing that you, you need to read because of the fact there are twenty five of those different techniques that you go through. And and what I love about it also is that um, you 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 tell a story. Um, so one of the stories that you tell is that you were in. I, I should be interviewing you rather than. Um, um, uh, uh, um, so you're in you're in Barcelona. Yes. <laughs> uh, you're in Barcelona, and you say, well, "I'm in Barcelona. I'm going to go for tapas." You, you, you got to do it when you're in in Barcelona. Go for a tapas meal. So you 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 got this name with this restaurant, um, and as you're about to go out, the concierge says, "You going out? Where are you going? Do you know where to go?" He said, "Yeah, I've actually got the name of this restaurant." And he said, "That's a really nice restaurant, but there's this one as well." Right. It, and it was funny because, um, uh, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, that's unusual. You know, where are you going? I tell them. And instead of saying great restaurant or good choice or enjoy your meal, you know, the response is, oh, that's right next door to another one. I'm thinking, hmm. so, you know, I said, well, um, is that other restaurant better? Because the one that I'm going to was referred to me by a colleague of mine. I had posted, uh, you know, on Facebook or LinkedIn that I was in Barcelona and she'd written said, oh, my gosh, I'm still remembering this fabulous meal I had at this restaurant and I looked it up and sure enough it was right next to the hotel so I thought great that's where I'm going and I'm heading out but the you know the concierge was like oh that's right next door to another one so I said well is that one any better but I think you know uh, by nature of the business a concierge needs to be kind of diplomatic and uh you know they just replied oh um well you know they're they're both good this one is just known for some more you know uh uh, unusual preparations. So I thought, wow, that's interesting. You know, so I thought, okay, on the one hand, I have the, you know, the concierge, that would be authority, right? Like that's the person who's supposed to know. And ever since we're young, we're taught to recognize and respect authority. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I should listen to them. On the other hand, I have social proof. A colleague of mine who's similar to me is telling me the other restaurant is great. So I say, well, look, they're next door to each other. I'm just going to walk there and I'll make my decision when I see the restaurant, look at the menu. And I get there and the one that the concierge recommended was dead tim there was nobody there it was so quiet and right next door was this bustling restaurant and 
there was a line out the door and I was like, you know, in a moment, I was like, absolutely going to the bustling one. You're like, going to join the line, aren't you? Because there's, there's got to be something, if, if there's sure. a line outside the all restaurant, it's got to be good, isn't it? It's got to be, all those people must be eating there, you know, all those people are eating there, it must be good. So I, you know, I put in my name and fortunately I was able to get seated relatively quickly, which was amazing given how many people and I had a fabulous meal. And then I thought, oh, but you know what's going to happen? I'm going to go back to the hotel and that concierge is going to say, so what did you think of my recommendation? And I didn't ask for the recommendation, but they gave me one. And, and that actually triggers something called the reciprocity principle, where even if you don't ask for something, if you're given something, whether or not you ask for it, if you're given something, you kind of feel indebted to the person who gave it to you. And I thought, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say, oh, I didn't go. So I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'm going to go next door and I'll have dessert, you know, I'll have a little dessert tapas and yeah. that'll be fine. I walk out the next door restaurant that the concierge had recommended was jammed with people, jammed with people. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I kind of, you know, wormed my way up to the hostess stand and I said, gee, is there any chance you can see two of us? And the, you know, the hostess had just hung up the phone and she said, we are completely booked, but I just got a cancellation. It was meant to be. And she, you know, led us to the only empty table in the place where I not only had dessert, I had another full meal because the food was so unbelievably good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, you know, she's teaching so many different uh, behavioral science principles at play there, you know, the authority principle and social proof and reciprocity. And, uh, you know, the result is I, I came home 10 pounds heavier because of behavioral science. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a great experience, but it's just really interesting the different ways that we make decisions. And, uh, you know, I, when, when I first got there and there was no one at the place that the concierge recommended, I thought, oh, maybe they get a, a kickback or something for recommending it. And that's what that whole game is. And it just turned out that they had a later crowd and both the, of the, the places in, were in, good. in Spain, they always go out later. Um, they tend to go out at 10 o'clock ish or rather than in, in the UK, we tend to go out from meal like six o'clock, whereas in Spain, they always go out later. That's yeah, yeah. Although the, you know, one was bustling, you know, right after work and the other one was, you know, so maybe it was an after work crowd versus a serious dinner mm. crowd. But I mean, they were both fabulous. I'd go back in a heartbeat. Let me tell you. <laughs> they were both so, so what was the what was the inspiration behind um, writing this then, Nancy? Because you're you're a, you're a first time author. So you got opportunity to write your first book. What was the inspiration? So, uh, you know, what happened was um, a number of years ago, I read uh, Robert Cialdini's Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion, and I loved it. And I was underlining things and highlighting and making margin notes and thinking about, you know, how can I use this in marketing? Because I am a, a marketer. I'm a creative director at an agency, right? And so I work for a bunch of different clients. And I, I was reading this book and I'm like, I could use that to help with this client. I could use that to help with this client. So I started to apply some of these techniques and sure enough, they're working. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is great. So I, you know, progressed to the point where now I've co-founded an agency, hung out my own shingle. And, and this is what we focus on. We focus on adding behavioral science to marketing best practices is to increase the likelihood that people will engage and respond to the marketing messages. And I speak at a lot of co conferences and I'm really passionate about this because I know that it works. And then Kogan Page noticed that I was going to be speaking at South by Southwest in Austin. And so they reached out to me from the UK and said, would you be interested in submitting a book proposal on your topic, you know, behavioral science, marketing? And so I thought, you know, why not? You know, a couple of times I'd spoken at conferences and people would say, Oh, I want to buy your book. And I'd be, oh, that's really sweet. You know, I don't have a book. And, you know, it would happen again. And again, I'd say, oh, it's really sweet. I don't have a book. But uh, when Kogan Page offered me the opportunity to submit a proposal, I thought, there are only so many clients I can work with. There are only so many conferences I can speak at. If I write a book, so many more people who do marketing, whether they have marketing in their title or whether they're doing a bunch of things and marketing is one of them, so many more people will have access to these tactics and techniques that and actionable practices that really, really make a difference. It's like, I've got to do it. So I submitted the proposal and uh, Kogan Page uh, accepted the proposal and here we are. So you, but you've got a background in, I mean, you talk about your background in advertising and, and marketing in the book. Um, and you, you actually bring a number of, as well as give, telling a story about like the, the story about Barcelona, you also, also quite often explain the story um, behind how you use that technique in your in your career. So, for example, the one that I talked about earlier on, which was you are facing an important decision. If you don't act quickly, someone will else will decide for you was I think there was a um, cable TV. Uh, yeah, there were a, a couple of examples, actually, because um, what I try to do in the book is I try to uh, talk about, a, you know, a, a case study or, or yeah. um, a little caselet or something. I also try to give a, you know, just a 
everyday example that someone might be like, oh my gosh, that was that what that was that principle that happened to me. It had nothing to do with somebody creating a marketing campaign necessarily. It just, you know, it happened to me. And then I give a lot of just very, you know, bulleted takeaways, you know, use it this way, use it this way, use it this way, use it this way. So for this particular one, autonomy bias, um, what was interesting was when I was a young copywriter working at what's now Digitas, uh, I came in one day and, and uh, my boss was like, I finally have the lead to this letter. I've been wrestling with this, this lead to this letter for, you know, days now. And what he was trying to do is um, create a letter that was going to convince businesses who had previously had AT&T to choose AT&T now that, uh, you know, the, the, telecom monopoly was, was being broken up the monopoly thank you was being broken up so even if you wanted to stay you still had to choose but a lot of people were going to sprint or mci because hey it was something new and why not and uh he ended up you know saying something like uh you have a decision to make and if you don't make one soon someone will make it for you and uh it, it worked incredibly well and so but when he told me about it i thought oh that's you know that's interesting neither he nor i really you know, we're thinking in terms of autonomy bias way back then. I, I you know, I had yet to discover behavioral science. He, he certainly hadn't either. Um, he just was thinking and thinking and thinking and, and decided this would work. But they got a 38.6% response rate to that particular package. Fast forward years later, um, now I'm a creative director and, uh, you know, I have my own creative department and we had a client that was doing um, satellite TV. Yeah. And what was happening was, you know, a lot, a lot of people were just saying, no, it's, you know, it's not worth it. Uh, you know, I'm paying for all these channels I don't use. I, you know, I don't want to do it. So we ended up using something, you know, well, we ended up using autonomy bias. We took this new product that the company had, which allowed you to kind of customize your channels. And we just really doubled down on the idea of autonomy bias. You know, we said, hey, this is your choice. You choose what you want. You're, you know, you're not going to be paying for things that you don't want. You can put these little packets together to, to create a custom channel for yourself. And it did incredibly well. They got a um, double digit response rate. We created a control for them. So there's this, there really is this innate desire for people to just not be told what to do that, you know, a, a, an adjunct to that is this idea of choice. And when you tell people, hey, look, the choice is yours, it's up to you, you know, you ask them to do something, but you say, you know, it's up to you, the choice is yours, it's your decision, you can actually double the number of people that will say yes to you. Um, it's, it's called the BYAF technique, the B, but you are free, BYAF technique. Be, but you are free. It's like, you know, Tim, I'd really like you to do this, but of course the choice is up to you. And it just makes you more likely because you're reminded, look, it's me that's in charge and um, people are more likely to do it. Uh, researchers at Tulane University found that if you put two things down in front of people, they're much more likely to make a buying decision in the moment than if you just put one thing in front of them. And, you know, and Tim, you might say, well, that's crazy. You know, someone you know, wants this coffee mug or they don't want it. What difference does it make if there's another coffee mug next to it? But, you know, when there's only one, the question is, do I, do I not want it? When there's two, the question is, which of these two do I want? Yeah. And we're much more likely to make the decision. It's a, it's, there's an old sales um, technique, which you, you don't say, will you have a meeting? You say, can, can you make next Tuesday or next Thursday? And then the decision is about that. Um, yes. and, it's very uh, powerful though. It, it works. <laughs> It does, yeah. Um, you tell one story also in there about um, you did. There was a, a pitch for a credit card came up, uh, and and you were um, you were not the incumbent. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so what you decided was to basically um, mix it up and stir it up a bit. Yeah, um, there's a. There's so you went a... in with a particularly zany because um, um, this is. You know, we don't get these in the UK anymore. We used to get them all the time. You get an envelope saying, here's a credit card. Um, and you did a particular um, zany um, uh, mail shot for this. Um, and But they gave you some interesting feedback, didn't they? Uh, yeah, well, you know, so we, we um, you know, we had never done a, a credit card before and we had the opportunity to pitch. And so we went out and we got all of these different credit card solicitations and we put them up on the wall. That was our war room. And we studied them and we thought, OK, whatever we're going to put in the market is going to go up against these. People are going to be seeing all of them because, you know, if you have a certain credit score, you're likely to get, you know, solicited by a number of different credit card companies. And we thought, well, ours has to stand out. And there's something in behavioral science called the... Um, uh, Von, von Restorff effect. And basically, it means that people notice and remember things that are different. So I thought, yeah. well, we have to do something that's going to be different because otherwise you cover up the logo and any one of these credit card solicitations could be from, you know, could be the same as the one next to it. So we created this, you know, bright yellow pack with, uh, you know, this 
fish island shot of somebody on it. It was just very arresting, you know, very interesting. And we go in to present it. And uh, I, I literally thought I was going to lose my job over this one. You know, the client was like, none of the things that drive credit card response are here. You're not talking about the interest rate. You're not talking about the, you know, the promo rate. You're not talking about the go-to rate. You're not talking about the fact there's no annual fee. And uh, we're like, yeah, I know they all say that. And uh, they're like, yeah, they all say that, you know, for a reason. For a reason. So we, uh, we kind of quickly ran back to the agency. They were, they were gracious. They're, you know, they gave us the input and, um, and then we were able to create another package that had those elements, but that displayed them in a, in a different way. It was still fresh. It was still unlike the next six packages that, you know, that were selling credit cards, but the important information was, was there. And uh, so they ended up hiring us and we went on to establish, I think seven or eight separate controls over the course of our relationship with them. So we, uh, we figured it out, but that, that one moment, we just got a little too carried away. And sometimes that happens in marketing. You know, we think, well, in order to catch someone's attention, we have to be different. And sometimes that can work, but other times it, it can backfire. Sometimes we need to say, look, you know, you can trust us because we are like other, you know, other products or services in the industry. You know, you 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 don't have to worry that we're going to be so far out there that we're not going to be any good for you. So, uh, you know, being different is good, but you have to know how different to be. You have to know when to really push it and when to kind of rein it in a little bit. So you've got just enough difference to be noticed, but you're not so different that you lose people's trust. So um, what is the... Um... I'm trying to pronounce it. Zygarnik effect then. Yeah, the uh, the Zygarnik effect. It's the named Zygarnik for, effect. Yeah. Yeah, it was named for a a, a Russian uh, psychologist named Bluma Zygarnik, and what she found was we have a tendency to remember things uh, until we, we have a tendency to remember things that are unfinished. So until we can kind of cross them off the list, they, they stay in the back of our mind and they kind of nag at us, nag at us, nag at us. It's why cliffhangers do so well in the media. You know, we're watching know, Game of Thrones or Squid Game or whatever, you know, we want to know what's going to happen next. You know, what's the next episode? How is this going to end? You know, we, we want to know, you know, what that, you know, what, what the finale is. We want that completion. We want that closure. And so marketers can use this because uh, if, you know, if people want to know what's going to happen next, if they're going to be remembering things until they can cross it off the list, you know, we can send, uh, you know, we can send messages like abandoned cart emails. Hey, you put this in your cart, but you didn't, you know, you didn't buy it. Um, you know, I, I received one from a company where they said, you know, hey, look, you, you designed your, uh, your card, but you didn't purchase it. Come back and purchase it. You know, and they're just reminding us, reminding us. It's also one of the reasons why, um, those loyalty punch cards work so well where, you know, you can have 10 blank boxes and the idea is, you know, get a, a, a check mark. Oh yeah. We, we've got loads of those for coffee shops and stuff like that, but you do, you, you, you want to fill, fill it up, don't you? You want to get each one filled out. And so there's some research that shows that if you, if you hand someone a card and the first box is already checked, they're 79% more likely to get the other boxes checked. So instead of having 10 <laughs> blank boxes, you can have 11 boxes 10 of which are blank and one of which is pre-checked, it's still the same 10 purchases someone has to make. But because it's been started, people are much more likely to, to finish it, 79% more likely. And that's, you know, coffees and car washes and, and all kinds of purchases, really. So um, uh, talk to us about um, um, status quo bias. Ah, so status quo bias, that, that's a tough one that, that marketers often have to overcome. So what happens is, you know, it's like inertia sets in and people, our customers, our prospects are just kind of happy keeping things the way they are. We, we don't like to change things up as, as a rule, you know, it just, just keep things as they are. It requires less mental effort. It requires less physical effort. And so what we need to do as marketers somehow is, is we need to overcome that if we're trying to get someone to try a new product, you know, I mean, if, if, if we're trying to retain our customers, status quo bias is, you know, it's very powerful. That's great. You know, but if we're trying to win somebody over, we need to somehow upset it. And, um, you know, there, there are a few different ways to do that, but, um, you know, a lot of them involve, of course, behavioral science, but if you're trying to overcome, you know, somebody kind of, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, just stuck in their ways, uh, you need to maybe make them feel that they'll lose out if they don't make a change, that there's, you know, there, that there's something at risk. Or maybe you use um, social proof and you explain to them a lot of other people are doing this. Maybe that's why you should consider, you know, kind of shaking off your old routine and trying something new. Um, or you could try, uh, you can try using the reason why. Uh, behavioral scientists have found that people are more likely to do what we ask them to do if we give them a reason why. So if you're trying to get someone to, uh, you know, 
upend their their current uh, vendor relationship or their their current product preference. You know, just telling them why your product might be better or your service might be better is a way to uh, to kind of shake them out of the status quo. Nancy, th thank you so much for coming on and talking about your book. I I, I found it. I I actually sat down and read it. I got it. I think it was a Thursday or Friday, and I sat down, and it was uh, over a weekend. It was just like pay, and and I don't normally do that with business books. It was a, uh, um, you know, I, I had to rush on to find out what the next thing was because it was just so interesting. Anyway, I found it really interesting, um, and um, that's uh, Nancy's book, "Using Behavioral Science in Marketing: Drive Customer Action and Loyalty by Prompting Instinctive Responses." Tim, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you and uh, and uh, sharing this information with your guests, your, your listeners, rather. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you. For Re remind project. people where they can get hold of you, Nancy. Sure. So, um, well, you can get my book from Kogan Page or Amazon or any place fine books are sold. You can find me on Twitter at N-H-A-R-H-U-T, at N Harhut. You can find me on LinkedIn and Facebook, or you can just email me, nharhut at me, M-E dot com. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing the, the details about your book and and, and also um, being willing to be quizzed by me about all the different uh, um, behavioural um, uh, science aspects. So thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you for everybody for all the comments uh, that came in as well. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Tim. Thank, thanks, Nancy. 